Good morning. Good morning to everybody. I think that we are online. My name is Salvatore Pinto. I got the honor to be the chair of this uh, session. Uh, we have, we have uh, with us uh, the Dr. Matteo Codazzi, that is the chief uh, executive uh, operator operation of CESI, Center for Energy System Integration in Italy. Then we have with us uh, the Dr. Martini, that is the director of the uh, department of uh, RSE. Then we have with us the, the engineer Christian D'Adamo, the head of network and system operation and maintenance of uh, Enel. Then uh, uh, I, I start with my speech. We have more or less uh, uh, 15 minutes for each speaker, and then we have uh, uh, some time for some question that uh, we are ready to give an answer. But I got the honor to start this session. Then uh, I will speak about uh, the, the grid security and new technology. Uh, we don't need to convince uh, no one that the, we need the renewable energy, that we need to, to combat against the climate change. That's, uh, that is clear for everybody, but in which way? Because we are now uh, different uh, things that are in the market. Uh, I speak about uh, automotive, then uh, we is in the transition. We are uh, now um, passing from the, the engineer, the motor that uh, is based in uh, oil and uh, we are going in electrical, but that means uh, that we need uh, a, a clear distribution of the energy in the country. That is uh, true for Italy, it's uh, true for Germany, it's uh, true for France, it's true for everybody. But uh, some country have uh, more problem than the other because that's the depend of uh, geography, that's the depend uh, of the state of art of the grid. Obviously, when we speak about the grid, we are speaking about the three different level of the grid that we are speaking about high tension, medium tension and low tension. The low tension, the automotive will give a lot of stress to the, to the grid. That is one of the uh, key points in the future because otherwise we'll become a bottleneck of the automotive. That uh, is the first point that I would to underline. But for sure, uh, there is a, a new technology that is uh, coming. Uh, I speak um, um, principally with the storage systems. Storage is the key point because without storage it will be impossible to realize uh, all uh, uh, plans that we have uh, to achieve the, the target that the European community give uh, uh, in the uh, 2030. That means that, that today we have uh, storage systems. Historically, the, the hydro power plant is a storage systems, but we are now a technology based in the lithium, lithium and the cobalt in terms of raw material. Uh, that is for sure the only possibility for automotive in this moment, but also for the other part of the, the systems, this technology have a lot of new things that is coming in terms that they are increasing density, is increasing also the use of the other raw material together with the lithium in terms of graphene, in terms of uh, uh, to, to take away cobalt, there is a lot of, of improvement in this technology. But in any case, the demand remain uh, more than the offer. That means that there is a, a room for a lot of technology, but the crucial point will be the raw material. The raw material is uh, uh, now the, the, the huge problem that in the transition we are uh, facing. Uh, as you know, uh, everybody knows that today we are under stress for the gas. We are under stress uh, uh, for the price that the gas uh, in this moment for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, speculation, uh, huge demand uh, after the COVID uh, is generating a lot of uh, issue. But in the transition, we have uh, for sure in parallel a lot of geopolitical problem that we need uh, to, 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 to understand. Uh, because uh, also in the storage, that is the new mm, crucial point, uh, uh, lithium for the more than 50% is in the end of the China. 
uh, that's uh, in this transition will become a potential problem. Uh, and last not least, uh, uh, Europe need, uh, in this case, they have launched the important project with the investment of more than 10 billion important project for common European interest to found a new raw material. And that is reality today. There is in the storage uh, an opportunity for new technology that is based, uh, is an hybrid from uh, fuel cell and, uh, and uh, flow battery. Uh, is, uh, they use only one chemistry. Uh, in this moment, there is uh, already plants, they use bromine uh, to produce hydro hydrogen. Other systems is nickel and, uh, and hydrogen, that manganese and hydrogen, and a lot of other chemists. What is important in the next future to have a portfolio of raw material, but for sure the, the, the storage need to, to achieve some results in terms of cost, uh, security, uh, whatever, that is the base. But what is more uh, really important is to have more raw material that we can use to store energy in the next future. But that uh, is uh, not a, a future that in 10 years, it's a future in the next four years. Another crucial point that uh, I give also the opportunity to other speakers to, 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 to give their point of view is uh, which kind of technology we can use to accompany the transition. Uh, gas for sure is, uh, is uh, the first one because we have a priority to, to close the, the coal. This is a priority at this moment. But also the nuclear, there is a uh, in some countries, it's impossible to speak about nuclear for uh, ideological reasons. But when we speak about uh, a nuclear, we speak about uh, a new nuclear power plant. There is already uh, 15 projects around the world that are uh, small nuclear. Uh, one is already operative in the United States. We are speaking about uh, 300 megawatt. It's based not in uh, uranium, but in the thorium. That is uh, less, uh, less uh, nuclear waste is more uh, more secure and that is uh, one technology that uh, we need to, to to think about because uh, uh, this transition is not for free uh, the is uh, it need, we need some some things to help the, the the distribution of renewable in the market but also to help the the, the new frontier of hydrogen because today hydrogen is still uh, this is still not a reality, at least in the term of cost, but for sure is an opportunity in the, in the future. And that's for this reason, when I speak about flow battery based in hydrogen, means that they take all the reduction cost that hydrogen will have in the next future, the technology that will be used together with the, with the hydrogen. And that means that we need to, to, to really, uh, let me say, um, look at the global level, because there is no one technology that is used for the transition. We need to, to be, uh, uh, let me say, absolutely clean in terms of, of, of things. Uh, which kind of technology we can put together to achieve our result? Our result is to, to be independent from, uh, from uh, one country or two country or the, the other uh, geopolitical issue that we have. Another one to uh, reduce uh, the CO2, uh, that is uh, important for climate change, but also to have a cost of energy that will be uh, able to give uh, a stable uh, expansion to the industry and not create the other issue that in this moment, the gas is creating. A lot of company in this moment is under trouble because they have no possibility to pay this high cost of energy. But I will to, let me say, um, stop my presentation uh, is uh, also a provocation for the other uh, speakers. Uh, uh, please, I will ask uh, Matteo Codazzi to start with this uh, presentation. Thank you, thank you, Salvatore. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me just uh, see if I can share my presentation here. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I've actually prepared my presentation in Italian, so pardon me. Uh, 
I beg your pardon, but I will switch to Italian in a, in a second. Quindi buongiorno a tutti. Eh, Cesi, una parola rapidissima, siamo il leader nel testing, nell'engineering e nella consulenza tecnica a livello globale nel mondo dell'energy dell transition. Operiamo in una settantina di paesi con eh, laboratori e, e, e uffici in tutti i principali centri del, del mondo. Li, li lavoriamo tipicamente con i produttori di componenti per sviluppare la prossima frontiera della tecnologia, lavoriamo con le utility nel, eh, nel progettare e realizzare le grandi infrastrutture energetiche, lavoriamo con governi e regolatori nel preparare piani energetici, strategie energetiche e e affrontare temi regolatori. Bene, molto rapidamente quello che sta succedendo in Europa lo sappiamo tutti, la battaglia eh, al cambiamento climatico, la decarbonizzazione, sappiamo tutti eh, insomma, del, del Fit for 55 eh, e quindi insomma, il fatto che alla fine come Europa ci siamo impegnando a, a raggiungere zero emissioni nel 2050 e a tagliare entro il 2030 del 55% le emissioni di gas serra rispetto ai livelli del eh, 1990. La sicurezza energetica è strettamente collegata ovviamente con la decarbonizzazione delle economie ed è uno dei pilastri fondamentali del pacchetto eh, Clean eh, Clear eh, for Energy. Ora ovviamente quando parliamo di sicurezza di fornitura, la cosiddetta security supply rimane eh, questo un tema centrale no? per, per gli obiettivi di decarbonizzazione e per gli obiettivi energetici dell'Europa, in particolare per quello che riguarda il settore elettrico. Per questo motivo ci sono due dimensioni della sicurezza energetica che devono essere opportunamente indirizzate per identificare delle soluzioni che siano eh, coerenti con un sistema energetico che deve essere obiettivamente, ob obiettivamente eh, eh, robusto. E qui eh, ci sono due dimensioni in qualche maniera della eh, sicurezza energetica. Uno eh, di essere eh, resilienti rispetto ad aspetti di vulnerabilità, diciamo rispetto ad, 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 ad eventi interni, eh, incidenti ad esempio, accidenti nelle reti, oppure vulnerabilità rispetto agli eventi esterni, qui basti pensare a quello che sta succedendo in questo momento con il gas russo e con le tensioni che ci arrivano eh, dalla Russia. Ecco, parlando per un attimo sulla vulnerabilità rispetto agli eventi interni, qui stiamo parlando della la, la, la capacità delle nostre reti e del nostro sistema di essere resilienti rispetto eh, ad eventi provocati internamente. Qualche anno fa nel 2017 ci ricordiamo tutti quello che è successo a proposito di gas con l'incidente di Baumgartner. Eh, più recentemente, e qui vorrei passare alla slide successiva, eh, 2019 e 2021 magari non noto ai, ai, ai più, eh, eh, sono stati insomma alcuni incidenti eh, della rete elettrica europea che eh, per quanto eh, hanno creato grossissimi problemi, sono però secondo me, secondo noi accesi degli, eh, dei, degli early warning, dei segnali eh, che, eh, che qualcosa sta succedendo, anche per il sempre più importante contributo che le rinnovabili volatili danno al, sistema, eh, delle, al, al nostro sistema energetico. Come sapete la vulnerabilità contro gli eventi interni si riferisce all'abilità del sistema energetico di resistere a guasti senza interruzioni della fornitura di energia, il cosiddetto criterio M-1. Eh, bene, qui eh, nel 2019, due eventi nel 2021, relativamente banali dal punto di vista tecnico, adesso non voglio entrare nel, nei dettagli, ma hanno creato eh, delle situazioni, eh, qui mi riferisco a quello di gennaio del 2021 o di luglio del 2021, delle situazioni in cui la rete europea si è... Eh, si è separata. Okay? Quindi abbiamo avuto a gennaio una separazione di tutta l'area dei Balcani e della Turchia rispetto al, reto, al resto delle, le, alle, delle reti del nord-west eh, europeo e a luglio abbiamo avuto la disconnessione dell'intera penisola iperica, quindi Spagna e Portogallo, rispetto al sistema elettrico eh, del resto dell'Europa. Quindi un segnale importante che qualcosa sta succedendo e qualcosa bisogna eh, implementare. Perché? Perché è, è evidentemente il percorso della decarbonizzazione è un percorso importante, virtuoso, ci, ci aiuta a ridurre la dipendenza eh, dalla, dalle commodity eh, che vengono al di fuori dell'Europa, eh, ma, eh, ma bisogna stare attenti a, 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 a fare degli interventi. Sorry, the conference is in English. I was, told, I, was told, I was told the conference was in Italian, actually. 
Sorry. Would you, would, really would you, sorry. Okay, would you mind? No, you can, I mean, okay, you can this, shift. I mean, we'll give you more time. I thought I thought you were you had you had actually a translation. That's what I was told. Oh, extremely sorry, we don't. All right, okay. So I was I'll try to switch to to English, therefore. All right. So and extremely sorry, sorry. All right, okay. So uh, the uh, so I was saying that the carbonization pathway will help reducing the fuel dependency while ensuring security of supply. Uh, provided, however, that a series of measures are, uh, are undertaken. So first of all, uh, we need to have more interconnections to match uh, renewable generation, volatile renewable generation with demand. So an increase in interconnections at every single country level and between the various countries in, in Europe. We also need to invest in storage for higher system flexibility. And, uh, and there are you know, many, as, as we all know, there are many solutions for storage. So here we are not only referring to, uh, to batteries, but we, of course, we're also referring to pumping storage, hydro pumping storage. We are referring also to uh, compressed air energy storage in other, in other ways. Uh, there is also an important role in providing this kind of flexibility into the, the, the power grid, into the power system. Uh, this is increasingly going to be played by uh, the so-called cross-sector coupling, uh, which on one hand will allow uh, several hard to abate sectors to decarbonize. And here, for instance, I'm referring to hydrogen, green hydrogen in particular, or also you know, electric mobility, et cetera, et cetera. So those technology on one hand allow hard to abate sector to fully decarbonize. And on the other way, they provide additional flexibility and indirect storage solution in a certain way to uh, to degree to cope with the volatility of uh, uh, renewables. Now, when we talk about uh, about external uh, vulnerabilities, uh, here is uh, is really a very hot and a very uh, a very topic of these very days, as we all know. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of what's going on in Europe at the moment with uh, a spike in the price of gas, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, on average surged by almost 600% in, uh, in, uh, in the last year with the huge problems with uh, storage, uh, storage capacity in Europe, which is only filled at 75%. Uh, uh, countries are heavily relying on gas for for power generation. And there's a, this is uh, this is created also a big spike also in the price of electricity, as we all know, and and this of course is also created uh, uh, also a spike in the price of the CO two emissions. So uh, all of this is creating a huge problems in terms of uh, energy cost uh, to not only citizens across all of all, all, all Europe, but also most importantly, if I can say so, to the economies and, and the companies and the business in our, in our continent. Uh, just uh, just a, a comment on a side is that, you know, we are talking about a lot, we're talking about, we're talking a lot about decarbonizing the sector, but the reality is that in these very days in Germany, uh, production of electricity from coal has increased 35%. Because you know, even taking into consideration the CO two, the increased cost of CO two, steel coal is uh, is is cheaper than producing electricity with uh, uh, with uh, with gas at the with the current gas prices. All right. So um, renewables are great, of course, and they give us the promise to change uh, change uh, the paradigm. Right. So they will uh, become a, a a complete change of the paradigm. Uh, in, in dependency of Europe from other countries. This is true, but it's true in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a particular way, in the sense that, you know, as the mainstream renewables will come online, this will definitely create and generate a shift into the geopolitics of the energy sources in the, in the sense that, you know, we will be uh, less and less reliant to, you know, Middle East, uh, uh, reliant from the Middle East or, or, or North Africa or, or, or Russia for our energy input, but more and more 
you know, the, the power will shift to those countries that are rich in uh, either wind or solar, because these are the two key resources in terms of, of, uh, of uh, renewables, of course. And there is another, and I would say most important, and, uh, and Salvatore was already mentioning this, uh, you know, in reality, yes, it's true. Uh, renewable will be more secure, but you know we will not be fully free from uh, from dependency from uh, from uh, from other countries of, or from other geopolitical areas or blocks. In the sense that yes, we will be less dependent on Russia, North Africa, and the Middle East. But you know, uh, with renewables, we need to understand who controls the key technologies and who controls the key commodities and the key raw materials, most importantly, that are fundamental for uh, for the renewables. And we also need to take into consideration what Europe, as a continent, as an economic bloc, has to implement right now in order to uh, decrease the possibility or lower the risk that in the future we might end up being so much more uh, dependent on other countries for uh, raw materials and technology. This is a quick snapshot of a study that was conducted by the European Commission, which basically says that if we look at, the, for instance, raw material and, and, and components and assemblies, we see that Europe and the US are pretty much in the same line. They, they both produce and control 14, 15% of the components of the assemblies. But if we look at the comparison of the European Europe Union with China, this is a very dark picture because we see that China controls 39% of raw materials against 3% of Europe. Uh, China controls 51% of processed materials against 23% uh, of Europe, 47% in components, 39% of assemblies. So. Really, if we look at this picture, it looks like, you know, really, really, China is really, really very much ahead of all of us. And I mean, not only the US, but, but Europe. Now, if we switch in particular to the new technologies and the materials that are related to certain new technologies, uh, you can see that in the, in, the, in the chart, you know, I'm talking about a series, and I want to mention each of them of raw materials and how they are related to the to the key technologies for producing electricity from solar, from wind, or you know, or or uh, producing motors for electric vehicles, or batteries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I just want to you know pinpoint the attention of everybody on two major raw materials. One is lithium, and the other one is cobalt. And according to the European Union projections, here uh, European Union needs will increase eighteen times by 2030, as far as lithium is concerned, and 60 times by 2050. And as far as cobalt is concerned, we're talking about increase of 16 times uh, in, in, uh, if we look at 2050. So this is a huge problem, right? You know, uh, we can assume that uh, if we do not act right now in terms also of understanding how to increase the capacity, how to explore new new areas to produce these raw components. I can see a situation where there is a huge increase in demand, limited supply. There is a competition between different sectors because also mo other, other sectors, think about lithium technology also powering the batteries of electronics components. So it's not only about you know, energy generation, but also is you know, electronics. So those two industries competing for a limited supply of lithium. So I can see already as an economist, a situation that will drive us to an increase in price of these commodities, commu and these commodities going forward. Uh, so this is absolutely an area of critical attention. Also, who controls the key technology is another. Matteo, last minute. Okay, it's another very, very much important item, and uh, you can see in this picture that there are, you know, uh, many countries that are well ahead of us. So. What are the measures to mitigate risk? Uh, and I'm concluding on this very slide. One hand, it is recycling. We need to act also in understanding how to recycle this critical component. I think in the traditional technologies, uh, you know, recycling is, uh, is something we are used to. 
but you know we are not used at the moment in labeling or inventing technologies or processes to recycle those cobalt to lithium uh, raw material that are needed uh, for uh, renewable. Uh, we need to think about substituting certain technologies, certain materials with others that are you know more abundant in nature. Uh, we need to think of new greener uh, technology, and last but not least, we need to think about. Uh, increasing domestic production. And we believe that there are many instances, uh, especially in Europe, when these uh, could be possibly. So finally, I think when we talk about renewables and, and the great future that is ahead of us, this is certainly true, but provided that we do something and we invest very quickly on reinforcing the grid and taking into consideration potential bottlenecks, not only on the technology, but most importantly, in terms of raw materials and raw materials supply chain and the future. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, now is the Dr. Uh, Luciano Martini. Please. Okay, thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm trying to share my presentation first. Let's see if I'm successful on this. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So thank you very much, as I said, for the kind invitation to RSC to contribute to this plenary session on grid security and innovative technologies. This is a very important topic and we at RSC are acting in the research side uh, on this topic as well. So first of all, some keywords, some trends uh, that we are all facing and it was very clear also in the contribution from uh, uh, Mr. Kodazzi. You see here some very important trends and keywords of recovery, of course, after the uh, pandemic it was really hitting 2020 with the depression and energy consumption all over the place due to the lockdown. Then we have 2021, that is, a, of course, a much better figure. Nevertheless, also in terms of emission, we bounce back to the original trajectory that is not very, very nice. Then other word is, of course, decarbonization. We all want to decarbonize our energy system, our economies. And then electrification, electrification mainly of the end use in terms of gaining higher efficiency from our appliances, from our daily life. Decentralization is something that uh, already happened. I guess our colleague from Enel will tell us how distributed generation is now the new way from million of generation point we are today. And uh, it, of course, they need to have a higher observability and a better control and automation of all these uh, distributed generation. That is why digitalization is in a different color because more than a trend is an enabler for this transition. I didn't mention system integration that is really a new keyword. It's important to see how beneficial it could be to integrate the different system and to move from the present system to a system of system where the backbone will be, of course, based on, on the electrical system, but with the important interfaces with the other energy sector, like uh, transportation, like uh, heating and cooling and waste, uh, other sector as well. This is just to give you an evidence, as you know, that the power sector is responsible for a significant amount of emission, global emission of CO2. And the, the trend, a global trend is not very nice because as you can see, we have an increase of about 72% of emission in terms of CO2 by the power sector from 1919 till today. This is a global emission. When we talk about Europe, when we talk about Italy, the situation is very much different, but what it count for the climate is of course the global CO2 emission we can count. Uh, there are several important documents, several uh, vision and roadmap that clearly state how we have to do, which is the pathway to the net zero. I just mentioned some of them, of course, the IA net zero by 2050 document, the ARENA World Energy Transition Outlook, and the Fit for 55 that was also mentioned by you before. And of course, it's clear to underline that each of the European member also developed their national energy and climate plan. In those plans, there are important targets, and those targets will be even increased in order to reach net zero by 2050. 
Uh, this is just uh, some um, clue, some information from both with reference from IEA and IRENA. It's important to clearly underline that the power sector emission need to be reduced uh, by far, let's say 80% in the next two decades. And this is, of course, it's a huge challenge. And uh, it's also important to clearly uh, have in mind that uh, by 2050, 86% of the global demand that could be covered by renewables and two thirds of this renewable energy will be coming from variable renewables like wind and solar. That means that our system need to be fit to incorporate such a massive amount of the renewables. And we have to operate our system with further more than 50% of VRE, keeping the system stable, securing the supply to the final customer and so on. This is just uh, still related to VRE, variable renewable energy, the situation around the world, some selected country. You see that in some case, a few countries are already facing the situation where more than 50% VRE is in the energy mix. But these systems are rather small. So we are talking about Denmark, Ireland, or Portugal that are having, the, in this case, a very high share of renewable. But uh, when you talk about large system like China, US or other, it's more difficult of course to reach such a big level because uh, they still need to be based on some energy produced by nuclear, some energy produced by coal and so on. So what we are looking for is a, a right energy mix according to the country, to the geographical situation they have, to the climate and, and so on. This is a, a very simple picture where we just underline the big change that is already ongoing from the yesterday system that was a fully integrated system to the today and the future system that is uh, connecting uh, several units uh, to, the, to the system. Some of them have uh, some uh, issue related to intermittency because of course they rely on, on VRE. Uh, some of them uh, are not only uh, a single flow, uh, single direction of energy, but there is are prosumer in our households or maybe vehicle to grid functionality in the sense that the vehicle can be connected to the grid and from time to time also support the grid in terms of energy. So uh, integrating VRE, what is key is to make sure that we unlock all available system flexibility. That means all solutions need to cooperatively work together. We can leverage flexibility from the generation itself. We can generate in a more variable way in order to accommodate the request from the different loads. We can also use a demand response solution in order to really to have a variable load in order to better match the generation that is available from renewables. We can really unlock flexibility in all means, also by using some very important solutions like storage that was mentioned by our chair at the very beginning of this session. So all of them are important and depending on the portfolio of solution you have available, you can decide which is the most cost effective in your situation in your own system. Uh, this is just a, a recall of the important work from, from IRENA, where they were able to identify 30 different solutions or approaches or technologies that are, can provide flexibility to the system from new technology, maybe based on IT or ICT, you see some wording like Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, the blockchain and other, but also, of course, a new business model, the, the aggregator is, is mentioned as a first item, market design, of course, a market for ancillary services, bidding for flexibility services, for example, and also system operation because the evolving role of DSO is quite clear and very much important in this transition. Now I change completely topic and then talk about grid security from the environment point of view. So everybody is aware about the extreme weather condition we are facing and our infrastructure is of course strained by these uh, very severe events that could be heavy rains, uh, heavy fall or, or snow and uh, earthquakes or, or extremely hot weather. So all of these, of course, is putting additional pressure to other system and uh, as in not uh, meaning to say that uh, the grid infrastructure is an important asset for each country that need to be preserved. That is why we have now to really move and uh, make our system more resilient 
more resilient means able to withstand a more difficult situation or also to be able to withstand multiple of these severe conditions at the same time. So this is our activity. That is something that is really covered by many of the actors from the research innovation point of view, from operational way and, and working. You see here just the definition of the resilience because of course we move from security to a system that needs to be fully resilient. And so it's the ability to limit the extent and severity and duration of system degradation following an extreme event or multiple events happening, even if they are not very likely to happen, sometimes we are in such an unfortunate situation. And what is still open and need to be researched, need to be discussed, need to be agreed upon, is uh, which is the way we can analyze the actual resiliency of our system, how we decide and implement all the investment that need to make our system more uh, secure and prone to withstand the event and the constraint and we is facing. And maybe also the interdependencies between different uh, critical infrastructure. And of course, uh, what is important for investment is also which policy and regulatory framework we have at our disposal in order to make this investment possible in the short time they are needed. This slide just to recall to all of us that what we are talking about is a very complex system. We have, of course, the power layer, the grid infrastructure, but on top of that, we have a, the ICT layer that also can bring many benefits, but also can bring also some uh, little or large uh, um, threats. Another important aspect is the human level, layer, the one that is control, is making maintenance and making the system fully operational. And then where weather condition I was mentioning before. Just starting with the weather condition, you know that our system could be exposed to heavy faults. So we have to evaluate the threat. We have to make sure that we know which are the vulnerability and the contingency that we are having to, to, to withstand and uh, which is the final impact of those uh, climate uh, impact on our system. In that case, it's important to improve our ability to make a more accurate forecasting, to monitor and to have a diagnostic on the important component of our system. In some sense also to be able to restore the system after a, such an event in the shortest time as possible in order to provide energy back to the final load. Last uh, two minutes. Uh, okay, Martin. very good. I will be quite close in saying that, of course, we have mitigation measure. We know how to deal with them and we are uh, using a portfolio of this solution. Then a few words about ICT. ICT, of course, is a big opportunity, it can help us to monitor and supervise the system in a better way. But of course, it's also bringing in itself some possible threat because our system is strongly relying on digitalization and this can happen that you have a digital disruption or cyber attack. Cyber attacks are increasing over years. So this is a 2019 report from WEC. In this case, you see that the number of attack and the number of groups that are bringing this attack are increasing. That means that we have to make our system also secure against the cyber attack. Cyber attack that can happen from to our corporate network, but they can also jump to the control network, the actual asset that we are managing. In this case, we have to avoid that this attacker can proceed and reach the final target that is the final device, the final system that we are managing. Uh, it's important to say in only a few words that, that this is like a, a full environment, a full ecosystem that needs to be digitally proof. And uh, uh, we need a network code dedicated to cybersecurity. This is uh, in place. They are going to be approved and also put in place by the regulator. And this is involved operator, supplier, and the end also the final prosumer and consumer. So the key word, of course, is to make a system that is secure by design and also to make sure that we have all the standard and the code that allowed us to be in that position. I will just conclude my contribution by saying that we don't have only challenges, but some of the challenges could become a huge opportunity. This is the case for electro electromobility, so electrification of transport, not only to reduce emission, but also to maybe have a new solution to support the system. 
You know that in the, in the Italian National Energy and Climate Plan, we have a very ambitious goal to be reached by 2030. In this case, 70 gigawatt of variable renewable energy. In this case, mainly uh, wind and solar. And this will, of course, be having like a very large fraction of our energy mix based on intermittency. So in this case, we will have something like 115 terawatt hour per year of intermittent generation. And all the million of cars that we plan to have in our system could be maybe possibly supporting with smart charging or with vehicle to grid functionality in order to have a, a better management of this intermittency because the car will be parked and their battery could be used effectively in principle to support the system in case of need. This is just a slide about the equal to grid. It's very important functionality. Still a lot of research and innovation to make this fully possible, but we are on the right track. Uh, again, you need I to will... close the door, Martini. Yes. I will close in a moment. This is just to underline that it's important to always interact with the whole ecosystem, in the, even in the case of electromobility. We have many actors to be playing at the same time in a parallel way. So I'm coming to my conclusion. Thank you for your time. Grid security is an extremely important topic and resilient to our system is something that we have to pay more and more attention in the years to come. So thank you for your attention and I will be available to reply to any question, if any. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, Angelina D'Adamo, please uh, take the chair. Yes, good morning. I'm trying to share the presentation. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I think that not yet. Not yet. I'm. I think I need to. Yes, to close the presentation. Yeah. Let's see if you can do that now. Are you okay? Yes. Please. Thank you. Perfect. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Oh, perfect. And so, good morning. And today, I'll present you our initiative as NL Global Infrastructure Networks to uh, transform in a digital way our grid to make uh, it more secure, more reliable, and more flexible. Uh, first of all, uh, our presence in the uh, world, uh, we are a global network player. Uh, we have our asset base, the, of course, in Italy, where we are the major distribution system operator, but also in Spain, in Romania, and in several Latin American countries. We serve more than 74 million customers and operate 2 million kilometers of electric lines. This is a huge infrastructure and we are subject to climate change, uh, energy transition, and all the uh, challenges of the future uh, of electricity. Uh, we were talking uh, about uh, the energy transition. Um, the presentation uh, of Mr. Codazzi and Martini highlighted how uh, the system is complex. Uh, we believe that the distribution grids are in between these two forces, the energy supply which becomes more renewable, but also more fluctuating, uh, more uh, unconventional. And the energy demand, which becomes more and more demanding and more and more flexible. The distribution grids are in between, are connecting uh, generation with demand. And uh, we believe that the role should be a role of orchestrator. What is becoming uh, challenging is the renewable integration from one side, the, managing, the management of energy flows, which are bidirectional, and the system security. Uh, so we are trying to develop a more flexible, digitalized and resilient grid, but also more sustainable one, enabling the uh, green digital transition. Uh, when it comes to the digital transformation, we believe that uh, there are four pillars uh, uh, on which we are building our infrastructure. First of all, the human interface. We believe that the new technologies could empower our field forces, digitalizing our operations. Uh, we will give you some uh, examples. Uh, the artificial intelligence is uh, now a new uh, opportunity 
to us to uh, add and to uh, um, enforce the possibility to detect anomaly, to uh, make predictive maintenance in order to uh, have uh, real reliable assets. The foundation layer is to us very, very important because we can uh, digitalize our assets with uh, 3D modeling, with beam technologies, uh, using uh, the, the new technologies to uh, be more efficient in our activities. And finally, the uh, sensorization of the uh, network through the real-time monitoring of our asset also at low voltage level. We believe that these uh, technologies together could increase and improve quality of service to our customers. First of all, the Network Digital Queen. Through the uh, new technologies, uh, LiDAR technologies, we can make a sort of uh, Google Maps street view of our networks. This is uh, very, very important because we can uh, design our net network, our plans in a more simple and digital way. And a clear example is the uh, BIM design of power plants. We can predefine brick block modules to build up our plants to be more uh, secure, more rapid in the configuration of the uh, plants and in making the construction phase and the uh, operation phase of our uh, network. Uh, what is also really important is also the sensorization of the network, the uh, remote control and the automation. Uh, these are three uh, fundamental levers to uh, improve the quality of service of our infrastructures. First, the remote control. We know that the most of uh, renewables will be connected to medium voltage and low voltage networks. We are increasing the degree of remote control of medium voltage network. We are, we are working very hard in automation and what is so-called self-feeding grid, which is able to uh, configure the scheme of the network within one second to provide uh, the uh, electricity to the customers uh, which are connected and uh, which are not interested by the default on the network. Surely it is uh, needed a low latency network, telecommunication network to, uh, to enable this uh, innovative uh, function. And also the low voltage sensorization of the network. Uh, how? Uh, we uh, sensorized the, the low voltage network through the smart metering. Uh, we have more than 40 million smart metering uh, in, uh, uh, in our perimeter. Italy, we are in the second generation of smart meter with open meter and also in Spain. Uh, we say that uh, smart meters are not only meters, but are, are uh, network digital sensors able to uh, have uh, information uh, in near real time about the load, the power flows, the uh, voltage, and able to communicate with the smart homes in the customer through in home devices, and also with third party uh, um, uh, actors, such as uh, uh, aggregators and uh, dealers of, uh, of electricity and suppliers of, uh, of electricity. Uh, this is one of our biggest investments in the last uh, years. Uh, we are working also to digitalize and to enable our field forces. Uh, we started uh, in, uh, in uh, the last uh, five years, several projects for the workforce management. We are adding artificial intelligence and new algorithms to make more efficient, more secure, our uh, operation on field. Uh, we are also using uh, new um, algorithms, uh, uh, quadratic and constrained binary optimization algorithms, quantum computing, to uh, enlarge the perimeter of optimization, to optimize the job assignment to our crews, also minimizing the travel time and the CO2 uh, emission, and increasing the productivity of the, the field crew. Um, finally, 
uh, people. We are working with 34,000 people in our perimeter, and we aim to create digital workers to replace uh, the screwdrivers and all the, all the uh, devices with new ones, with pan top, with laptop, in order to communicate with the new devices, protection devices, telecommunication devices. We are also relying on new technologies, such as, for example, remote assistance, virtual reality for training for safety uh, issues, and augmented reality to improve also the way, the way of working of our people, of our personnel, because we think that also people and field crews will be crucial to meet with the uh, challenges uh, of the new uh, energy paradigm in the future years. And that's uh, all for, for the moment, and I'm available for questions if needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then we have uh, more or less eight minutes for some uh, question. Uh, if there is somebody that will raise a question, we are ready to give an answer. Maybe I start uh, with a question to Engineer Dadamo. Uh, uh, um, I look at all the business plan of uh, the company in the automotive, uh, how, how many cars they will to sell in the next future. They would oblige it to sell, otherwise they fail because they make a huge investment in the, in the electrical car. Uh, my question is, uh, do you believe that the, the, the distribution that in Italy is not only Enel, but it's also different uh, company are, are working on, is able to, let me say, to give the right energy with the, the right factor uh, uh, to everybody to, to, to sustain this, uh, this business plan? Surely the, the electric vehicle will be uh, the, the major challenge uh, for the network in the future. Uh, I think that we have to act in two ways. One is surely the capacity of the network. So increase the, the capacity of the cables, uh, uh, new investments uh, uh, to, to meet uh, uh, this, uh, these new requirements of the, the, the cars. But also we can work on, uh, let's say, on the software of the uh, charging, because in my opinion, uh, peak shaving, uh, vehicle to grid, and so all the management of the uh, charging process of the car could avoid peak demands. Uh, and we always know that when we have peak, the, we are not optimizing the usage of the, of the system. So I think that we have uh, to act both ways on the hardware, copper and iron, because we need to increase the capacity of the low voltage network, adding sensors, adding uh, intelligence into the, the low voltage network, also to manage the charging infrastructure and uh, use peak shaving actions, and also be able to read to uh, solve local congestions and optimize the, the system. Thank you very much. I can also contribute to that question if you like, or you have a special question for us. Please, please. No, I want to say that this uh, electrification of transport is extremely important. And we made some study for NSOE for the kind of position paper to really analyze the, to make the electromobility an opportunity for the system more than a challenge. It was clear that the, in terms of energy, the uh, electromobility will not be posed many challenges to the system, but of course it can make a challenge in terms of power, especially if we are not able to manage what we call fast charging or supercharger. That means the charging point with above 150 kilowatt that can really be very high pressure up to 350 kilowatts for the system. So it's important to really make this uh, infrastructure for charging available and also to use the water will be very beneficial with slow charging at home. That means providing people with the possibility to charge your car during the night. You know, there is an also a possibility from Arera that will allow to use our uh, smart meter up to six kilowatt during the time from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in order to slowly charge the car that will be just ready for you to use it uh, in the uh, early morning. I want to say that uh, together with Chesi and thanks to Chesi, we organize our 
charging infrastructure for our fleet here in Milano. We are very proud to make a testing and solution available for making the charging more effective in the near future. Thank you, Matteo, for this great possibility at your place. Thank you. There is other question from uh, the, the people that is connected, because as if there is no question, I got a question for uh, Matteo Codazzi. No question. Matteo, I got a question for you. Uh, uh, as you know, we have a, a huge challenge in the transition, transition renewable, but permitting remain a huge problem. Uh, this plan uh, need uh, a very strong, uh, uh, let me say, simplification of a bureaucracy. In any case, we need some new technology to accompany no? this transition because uh, uh, we need to, to, to close the, the coal. Uh, we need the, that the gas remain, but the gas is an issue. I speak about the nuclear. As you know, nuclear uh, is uh, something that in some country for ideological reasons is, uh, is uh, out of, of the scheme. But in other country as France, uh, but also USA. Uh, when I speak, uh, is I speak about a, a new nuclear system, so also for production of hydrogen, you know? What do you think about? Well, I, I, I need to say that, first of all, I'm a, 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 I'm a fervic uh, pro-nuclear uh, guy. I mean, if we look at uh, from a technical and economic standpoint, I think it makes a lot of sense. As Chase, you are working on, uh, on the ITER, uh, the ITER uh, consortium, also working on the next uh, generation. Of course, the problem of Yuruka is always the, the, the issue related to the acceptability. Um, so I am uh, I'm absolutely in favor. I think is the long term is one of the I'm not saying that it's the only one, but it's one of the long term solutions that probably we are facing. Um, and I'm, here I'm speaking about the next generation of nuclear. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to come, you know, in uh, in uh, in uh, in very short time. So there is a, a time lag that we need to breach with some other you know solutions from a technical standpoint uh unfortunately you know um practically i think you know the the way in which this is regarded uh, from the general public is unfortunately still uh, uh, influenced and biased by what happened in the past so it's going to be a hard sell to uh to the general public, so I need. I think that not only we need to work on the technology, but also in in communicating to the general public, you know, uh, what the next generation nuclear technology is and what the real benefits and the real implications uh, would be. Thank you, Matteo. If we have no other question, we have a perfectly on time. A little bit, one minute. Uh is uh, already in our hands. Uh, if you, if somebody will to add the something. Otherwise we can close the session. Thank you to everybody for your contribution and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.